Welcome to Ghostly. Was the Enfield family haunted? Ghostly is a podcast that comes out every other week. In each episode, we take a ghost story or paranormal event and look into its complete history. Rebecca then gives us evidence proving that the story is real. And my job is to debate those pieces of evidence and get you, the listener, prepared to vote on if it's real or not. If you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. And as always, we're your host. I'm Pat. And I'm Rebecca. What's been going on, Rebecca? Well, we are in the midst of the the spooky season. We are. I mean, it's kicking off. We're we're getting ready. We are full on into the spooky I season. I should I should say that. Yeah, we've had our live events. We're planning every all these episodes. Yes. I, I, it's super exciting. Well, you know, we do have another uh, live event coming, and I don't know the exact date, but Ghostly will be at Wizard World. We we hope. We hope, yeah. If, <laughs> I mean, I, I do want to give that because you know what? With the times as they are. Yes. The times we, they are are changing. We, you know, fingers crossed. It works out. Yeah. Fingers crossed, legs crossed, hair crossed, everything crossed that yes. it happens. Yeah. I don't want to promise. <laughs> really excited about it. Um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, pretty much, you know, we put out an episode last week, so... I don't really have much going on. I mean, it's been trying to get ready for this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I've been looking forward to to this episode for a long time. It's been on my a list. Long, long, a long, long time. Long time. It's been on my list. So I'm, yeah. I'm really excited we're getting to it. It's I think it's a great uh, start uh, for just the the ride right into Halloween. Yep. Can't yep. wait. Can't wait. Absolutely. And so we don't have any shout outs on this particular episode, but there are two ways that you can get a shout out in Ghostly. The first way is to give us a review on Apple Podcast, and that's review, not rating. We've had a couple of ratings, but we don't know who these people are that rated us. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't tell us, so we can't give you a shout out, but uh, but the reviews, we can. And we always prefer the five-star reviews, but we'll read any and all reviews that come our way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the second way is to either buy us a coffee on buymeacoffee.com slash ghostlypodcast, or you can actually just go to our website, ghostlypodcast.com, and you can hit the buy us a coffee button in the menu bar. And there's also like a little thing on the bottom of the page where when you get in, it says you can now buy us a coffee. (laughs) Right. Uh, And you could even become a member on buy me a coffee for ghostly. Absolutely. And you know, I, Sometimes we get people that think that that means you're literally buying us coffee. No, it's not literal. It it's you know, it's just helping us keep this this train going yeah. and sometimes that does include coffee. We're yeah. not lying about that. Uh, <laughs> but there are other things as well yeah. <laughs> involved in the in the making of ghostly. So so we appreciate it if you find it in your heart in this spooky season, this spooky season of giving. <laughs> to buy us a coffee. Uh, it's it's the giving season for ghostly. It's the giving season for ghostly. Right? For ghostly so <laughs> we appreciate it. All right, let's let's dive right into the listener mail. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, all right. Um, so uh, this is from Tess and Tess. Tess. Uh, sorry, kind of copied weird on our uh, um, <laughs> on our script, but it, it is Tess, um, and she is from another country whoa i know i'm gonna i'm gonna read the letter and we'll find out from where super exciting to be international zimbabwe no oh listen i told you listen you gotta have patience guatemala we're huge in guatemala we are huge in guatemala for i don't there's like probably like (laughs) one person that listens to us maybe two but only five people in the country listen to podcasts right i don't i'm not sure that's i mean or that listen to history podcasts i don't know anyways if you're our guatemalan listener we'd love to hear from you yes We'd, We'd love to hear from you, yeah. and thank you for getting us so high in the Guatemalan charts. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Yeah. All right, okay, but this is not our Guatemalan listener. Okay, uh, so Tess says, Hi, I've been following your podcast for a while, and I've just reached the end. I need more episodes. I love it. Don't worry, Tess. We are working on it. The This uh, from like mid-September through October. It's every week. Every week. Every week we're, we're producing them, so we'll, we're, we're pushing them out. Uh, okay, she says, uh, I live in 
Norway. Oh, Norway. I was going to guess. That was my next guess. That was your next guess? Yeah. Yeah. I. It's fantastic. It's very exciting. I love that we have people all over the world. Uh, I live in Norway, and I've shared your podcast to my friends, and I know some of them are listening. Yeah, we're going to take over the charts in Norway. Shout out to Tess's friends. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I like to think of myself as something in between, both skeptic and believer. What ah, do you call it? Skeptical Skep- believer. Well, she has some guesses. Okay. Uh, skeptiver. Skeptiver. I skeptiver, like that. Skeptiver. Uh, bel- Belitic. Beltic. Bel- Beltic. Beltic. <laughs> I don't know. You, we can all keep working on it. <laughs> anyway, I think it's healthy to linger in between. And no, I don't think orbs are real. Sorry, Rebecca. Ah. Oh. Well, didn't I mean we used to call them tweenies, right? Uh, no, that has never been a thing. <laughs> that has. is inappropriate and will probably get us banned from things. Oh, so let's come on. not use that word. We are too old for that. Uh, if you are a tween, you're fine. But if you're not a tween, you don't get to use that word. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but it's story time. So here goes. I know a girl who partly works as a ghost hunter. She and her team had an assignment in the city I used to live. So she asked me if I wanted to come and see them in action the next day. I accepted, but knew nothing of the assignment, the exact location, what kind of place it was, who they were going to visit or anything at all, really. She told me to write down everything I could think of regarding the assignment in order to pinpoint some psychic details or whatever. I wrote down a list on a piece of paper, uh, a white house in the countryside next to a field of wheat crops and a red barn. Somehow I thought the house was in the field, but not part of the daily farm life. A middle-aged woman in a white flannel shirt, dark hair and blue jeans, a man haunting the place, perhaps father or grandfather, Something about the stairs in the house, couldn't pinpoint exactly what, and some other generic details. I got goosebumps all over when I got to the location. Everything matched, down to the flannel shirt and wheat crops. And the house was a rental. It was extremely unnerving. I got so spooked, I felt I couldn't tell anyone, so I kept crunching the note in my pocket instead and kept quiet. I just listened to everyone and let them guide me around. The woman said her husband and grandfather had passed away and her daughter never felt alone in her room on the second floor. So they thought maybe the husband and grandfather still lingered, um, uh, lingered somehow. And the stairs, the EMF reader meter went crazy once and only once when we walked down the stairs. The woman laughed and said maybe something passed us on the way down since she, since she used to hear heavy steps there all the time. We measured everything from bad plumbing to electric wires and squeaky floorboards. Nothing was out of the ordinary. We did, however, find a dangerous level of radon in her basement. So naturally, we advised her to get it fixed instead of hanging around down there. I can't explain how or why I knew all these things. I didn't get any information whatsoever beforehand, and I hadn't checked on any of their previous cases. I didn't really know this ghost hunter girl very well. We were more acquainted than anything else, but I was not comfortable in that seemingly quaint and cozy house. I loved the family, but I was so happy when we left. I had no normal explanation for this. I just knew. Anyway, keep up the amazing work. work. Kind regards, Tess from Norway. Wow. Well, thank you, Tess. And during your story, um, you know, sometimes I zone out a little bit and... um, think about some of the things that are being said, you know, and I just thought to myself how much it would suck to be a ghost and have to just walk up and down stairs. <laughs> like that would be my version of hell. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it would it would be pretty much up there. Well, let's just hope that's some just some sort of residual energy, not the full, you know, soul or spirit of the person, just kind of some some energy left behind. Yeah. Because let's, yeah, it would. Let's not hope be, for that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, walking up and down stairs. It's like, man, I don't like to do that, anyways. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, yeah. you know, man, you really, you definitely have that uh, psychic ability there, Tess, to uh, to have thought of all of that before you went. So we, sure, we appreciate <laughs> we appreciate your story. I absolutely do. Thank you so much, Tess, and uh, thank you for passing us on to other Norwegians. Yeah, seriously. We know we we always mention this at the end, but uh, 
if you could mention us to some people in your life or, you know, if you buy a T-shirt, uh, sometimes people will ask you about it. Anyways, anything yeah. you can do to pass a word on to a friend or two is absolutely- Or 10. The, or 10 you know, uh, is really the best way for yeah, us don't, to grow. Don't limit it to two, you know, you can- I mean, I just want to make it manageable for people, okay. but it's true if at, you have more- At least one, yeah. right? But, you know, you don't have to stop at any particular point. <laughs> Uh, so how can they give you ghost stories to read on the air? Absolutely. We love your ghost stories. Uh, it's, it's, we need them. We want them. Uh, and uh, you can email us at info at ghostlypodcast.com or use the contact us form on ghostlypodcast.com. Or if you're out and about during these spooky times and you find some fun postcards or you want to send us a letter, write it out the old fashioned way. Uh, you can mail us uh, at P.O. Box number 264, Geneva, Illinois, 60134. And of course, all of that information is at ghostlypodcast.com. If you forget, just scroll to the bottom. Yeah, the address is right in the footer. So if you if you are driving right now, don't stop and write it down because that would just waste time. You could just go to the website. Yeah. All right. So uh, I don't think we have any polls, right? Uh no we do we oh, do no. yeah I, I know last week we didn't have a debate but uh, oh, man, but two I weeks that. ago we did so it's oh, poll time it's poll it's poll time yeah it is so the last episode that we our regular episode that we talked about and debated was mm-hmm. our Bluff City Cemetery in Elgin Illinois which uh where we of course were live at the Blue Box Cafe in Elgin Illinois and uh, we debated. Uh, the cemetery, and and very specifically, our our dueling shadow people photos. Yeah, which I definitely won that. Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, what? I'm pretty sure I won that. Well, no, I think I won. Well, let's see what the poll right, says. Let's see what the polls All say. Right, We're the... going to leave it to the people. <laughs> All right. So we have yes, seventy one point four percent. Hmm. And no, 28.6. How? Uh, I actually thought it was going to be even a bigger landslide than that, but I think you got some last minute no's in there that uh, changed it a little bit. Wow. (laughs) I'm sorry, the crowd was with me and the audience at home was with me. The skeptics were with me totally. (laughs) Well, and we do do an overall rating now, which is really cool because you could be just like us and give us an overall rating Although you cannot do a zero like I can. Uh, So they can do a one through 10. That's not just because I'm evil. That is because of software uh, limitations with that. Um, So people are really starting to understand this a little bit better, I think. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the yeses are all giving really high numbers and the noes are giving really low numbers. Yes, I think we're starting to to yeah, figure out the yeah. the scoring system. Whereas before we would get a no that gave us a 10, yeah. <laughs> which is weird, <laughs> you know. Uh so yeah, so 1 being not haunted at all, 10 being the most haunted place ever. Mhm. And we got a 6.14. Yeah. So, you know, if you're someone like Tess from yeah. Norway, where you're kind of that uh, in between, um, that skeptical believer or uh, <laughs> uh, what was the the skept- skeptiver? I like the skeptiver. I think that's then the belectic. Be- le- be- le- I, I don't know. Skeptiver sounds mm-hmm. better to me. But anyways, if you're that kind of in the middle person. Uh, I think these scoring these uh, kind of gives you that opportunity to be like, yes, I believe it's haunted, but maybe not like super haunted. Absolutely. All right. I'd like to welcome Mr. Bob Anderson of Bob After Dark back to Ghostly. Bob, thank you so much for coming on. What do you got going on? Oh, hey there, Pat and Rebecca. Before I say how I'm doing, how are you guys doing? Oh, man, we're fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. This is, I mean, this is our time, right? This is, I mean, this is the spooky season. Yes, we've, uh, it, this, it's funny because people bring up to me a lot. They're like, well, what do you, what do you do for October? Or how do you celebrate Halloween? Because I literally live Halloween all year round, especially right? <laughs> myself and what we do, right? So it's, you got to amp it up or you got to spice it up somehow for October. So we're, we're gung ho into our, uh, our big 
theme for the month on Bob After Dark, and it's we're excited about it. It's Ooh. this is this is our time for us to shine. What is your theme for October? So I'm actually going to be writing on Ghostly coattails a little bit Mm. except Mm -hmm. i'm going about it in a little different manner so october is exorcism month oh Oh, interesting yeah Yeah, but so instead of talking about like a famous case or um you know different different things i'm approaching it from the standpoint of what an exorcism actually is Mm. and i have three guests lined up for the month of october uh, who have performed exorcisms in different faith bases? I, I heard, so, and that is so awesome. I'm so excited for I those episodes. Am there for all of these. This is very so exciting. So I, uh, I can announce it on Ghostly first if you guys want to hear my lineup. Absolutely. Yeah. So my first guest for the uh, first week of October, we have the Catholic priest who performed the exorcisms and was on set directly in the demon house gary uh zach Bagans amazon movie thing oh wow the so the priest that was involved with that investigation approached us to come on the show because he was local to northwest indiana and that was a tony panic panic exclusive right there so we're very excited to have that wow we're going to be the first podcast that he speaks up spoke to about what he witnessed at the demon house. So we're very excited about that. Very excited. That is amazing. Yeah. And then I have a, a rabbi from Texas who teaches Jewish mythicism um, at the university of Texas A&M. He's a, uh, he's been, uh, he obviously he's a rabbi, but he's been teaching for 40 years on the topic and he's been directly involved with what the Jewish faith would consider an exorcism. Yeah. That, that's the guest I'm most excited about. Yeah. It's an interesting take because their, their version of demonic entity and poltergeist activity is a lot more gruesome, I think, than like a Catholic, you know, based faith or, you know, something like that. The Jewish faith does not mess around. Awesome. So I'm looking forward to hearing what, you know, baddies lurk in that faith. And then finally, I have two witches uh, coming on the show for the October for Halloween episode uh, who are going to be talking about exorcisms and warding off a house in uh, in this in the sense of a person who practices, uh, you know, spiritual based things, witchy stuff. Wow. Pagan kind of stuff. Yeah, so pagan and um, just general witchy stuff. Mm-hmm. So why do people sage their homes or why do people sure. put stuff on the floor and salt it up? Th- this is going to be the stories of why people do that, especially in 2021 with like a new modern age spiritualism movement. These are going to be from people that practice this on the daily. Love it. And this, is, this is their faith. This is their life. So you're going to hear the stories from their point of view on what an exorcism actually is and warding your house and cleansing, et cetera. Oh yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that's coming up in October, you said, right? So soon. Oops. I have, um, I have three episodes in October this month because nice. one episode I will be, out of state for for something major which we'll talk about later (laughs) Um, uh so we have three episodes and that's going to be our theme for october and i'm super stoked about wow i'm super excited for you guys and i'm like super super excited because i'm a listener of bob after dark i i love your show so i can't wait i I like how you claim that for yourself like i'm a listener of bob after dark (laughs) i am i am a listener (laughs) It's worth though. I'm a listener of Ghostly. I tell everybody when they ask me what I listen to. I don't listen to a lot of paranormal podcasts because I live this week to week. So my podcast listenings are usually like comedy based or like commentary based. I only listen to like two paranormal shows, and that's Ghostly Podcast is number one. So I I, I love being on the show. <laughs> I am. I am a listener of Ghostly Podcasts. Well, there you well, go. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Well, no. I'm so yeah. We yeah we did exorcisms a couple years ago for our October theme. Uh, but yeah, very different, different yeah, take because we I love we that talked idea. about some famous cases and uh, so. Anyways, if you're if you're preparing for Bob's podcast, if you wanted to go back and listen to Ghostly's exorcism <laughs> episodes, you could as Absolutely. a preparation. But they're they're they will uh, they're definitely. Uh, different takes on the same topic. So yeah. very exciting. All right. So should we get into the Enfield case? Yeah, let's do it. 
All right. So a little bit of history for us doing Ed and Lorraine Warren's investigations. Uh, we did the first Conjuring. We did Amityville. And together with Bob, we did Annabelle. And Bob had challenged us to do Devil Made Me Do It. So we did it. And we had forgotten in this process to do the Enfield case, which is um, what The Conjuring 2 is based on. Some people say that this was the most documented possession in history. And I think it's probably the scariest of all The Conjuring movies. What do you guys think? Yeah, it is really. I mean, of The Conjuring movies, I mean, some of the Annabelle ones, you know. They don't scare me at all. They're pretty spooky. Uh oh. And I liked the one, and I, I wish I, I don't know why my brain can't remember the title, Bob, but the one where they were like, it, it's the daughter, they're like the, the Warren's daughter, and then like all the stuff in the room comes to life. Anyways, that was, that was an excellent movie. Uh, but of the Conjuring movies, I, the Enfield case is, uh, is a spooky one for me, and that movie, I, I, the movie itself was pretty good. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I've been excited to do this one for years, actually. <laughs> I've been waiting to do this episode. Yeah. So, Bob, what are your thoughts? What is the scariest of the Conjuring movies? Well, obviously, for me, it's at the first Annabelle film because uh, <laughs> yeah, dies, right? Yeah, right. I, uh, <laughs> but after that, it gets really hokey because they somehow mm-hmm. make three movies off of a story that may take 20 minutes to tell. <laughs> <laughs> So somehow they made three films based on this tiny bit of war. So the first one, first one ties into the stories that we know. I don't, I never even bothered with the second and third one to be completely honest. Whoa. But I, so the contract, it's okay. I, I will tell you out of all the Ed and Lorraine Warren cases out there and what they could base the film on. Oh boy. This episode, it was a hard one for me to agree to come on because I'm going to have to admit several things here. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm excited for, for the admissions to these things. Um, but yeah. you know, I would say that the plot is better on the devil made me do it. Conjuring three than than this, but this is probably like cinematically the scariest of all of them to me. I would, I would say though, the devil made me do it. In my opinion was probably the most prolific case in Ed Lorraine Warren's like repertoire, I guess. Mm. And I that movie that movie is a little bit more terrifying to me. That one's a little bit more of a scary story because it's so prevalent, mm-hmm. and that that one scares me. This one, not so much. Well, you're not okay. a teenage girl, Bob. So mm-hmm. or or is he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's the Mothman. <laughs> I, I am not. Let me real quick. Let me just come clean about something. I am not the Mothman. Oh, but you are a Mothman. I, I understand. I am not the Mothman. I am not the, uh, the tick sidekick Arthur. I am just Bob <laughs> who happens to really like Mothman. Mm, so you're admitting that you are the Mothman. I no, understand. I Thank I you, fan. Bob. <laughs> now, Bob, I wanted to ask you a question before we get into Rebecca's ghost story. Um, so what is the difference between a poltergeist and like a regular ghost? Well, that's a good question, because in regular ghost sightings and in regular ghost stories, typically there's, you know, you got your two levels, right? You got your intelligent haunting and your residual haunting. Mm-hmm. The residual is, I see this thing every morning at two o'clock and it walks across my hall. Same time, same place every day, doesn't matter what I do, it won't interact with me. Um, think of it as like a time loop, right? And then you got yeah. intelligent things that'll directly involve with you. Now, sometimes these are positive cases, sometimes they're very neutral, and then you have the negative stuff. And then the negative stuff is just the you know regular old spirit that's throwing things around your house. Then you might move into poltergeist territory, things where you might move into a room and there's a bunch of kitchen chairs up on the table or <laughs> yeah, that's, that's usually one of the telltale signs of it or things are moved around the house or things come flying out of a kitchen cabinet towards you. Mm. But funnily enough, most poltergeist cases are actually not what you would think they are. A lot of poltergeist stories and activities are actually things that we could prove that the person did, uh, whether it be some sort of like second residual energy that they're, you know, they infect their environment around them. So when I'm really angry, something might fly off a wall. 
that's not a ghostly thing. That's maybe just a natural phenomena that happens when you're, you as a person affect the energy around you. And the other thing is it's it, a lot of times it could be, I blacked out and I did this when I was so angry. So I got mad and I tried to clean my floor in my dining room. You know, you get, you get in that mode. That's what you do when you're angry is clean your kitchen some floor. People, some people do though. That's wow. the people people handle anger differently some people just get into a cleaning mode so a lot of times these poltergeist cases could just be answered by i've affected the energy around me or that i just blacked out when i was really mad i set up all my chairs to you know anger <laughs> sweep under my dining room table and i forgot i did that nice and i walked into the room and it's like oh my god so yeah a lot of poltergeist cases are just cases of people being people now I will say though, I mean you're saying it in a in a way, a very scientific way. But I, my guess is that Pat is gonna say there's no such thing as someone altering the energy around them to make something fly off the shelf by energy manipulation. I mean, in the air. I mean, I'm open to the concept. I just have not ever seen proof of it. That's all. Okay. I mean, you've never been. You've never been in a room where you've been angry and like the 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 tension is thick in the room because of like you're just protruding this anger or maybe you're in a place of like severe depression and you just you feel that in the room and something goes wrong or you feel like things are going around or completely going wrong around you. Um, for example, let's say you got really mad and you turn on your lamp and your light bulb just goes out at that, that exact moment where you've gotten so really upset and mad. You don't think there's something to that? No, I mean, nothing physical. I mean, I will say that I, I am a firm believer that if you wake up in the morning and you're like, this day is going to suck. This is the worst day ever. I'm, I'm having such bad luck that that's going to continue throughout that whole day. You're going to make that happen. Um, but I, I, I've never seen it physical. I mean, but then again, last week I was in a room where a phone flew off of a couch. So I, I don't know. <laughs> and, that, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying every case that's out there is directly resulted in that. It could be nothing or it could be an actual angered spirit running around. But as far as that's concerned, you usually that sometimes you can explain it with just you, you all need to, you know, take a moment of zen and take a breath. I guess what I want to say with this, though, just based on on this and, and to point out is that concept of me or someone with my with my feelings and my emotions somehow, again, disrupting or affecting energy around me and causing physical changes to my environment that I'm not doing by touching the object would be considered paranormal by many people doesn't mean it's a ghost but it's not necessarily like a sci like a scientist in the lab would be like yep that's a thing that happens well, like i, I mean, think it's really, still paranormal we're really talking semantics here we're talking oh, definition so no 100 percent. i just don't i just want to say because to me i believe it like i think it happens i know it happens i've seen it happen so but again i i don't I want to like because this is this is an interesting debate, and I think this is this why I wanted to do this story um, because I think it's important to talk about the fact that often uh, people that are going through adolescence, um, oftentimes it's reported as girls, but uh, I think it could be boys as well. Um, th some people will say that that is a very vulnerable time. Again, a lot of emotions, <laughs> a lot of energy, and that sometimes it's spirits feeding off that energy, but other times it's really just them manifesting that energy into things happening. And so I think that's going to be a discussion today, you know, right. with this case. But I think at this moment, we're getting far off the original question of what a poltergeist is. So, so I'd like to take it back one second. And sure. the Google definition is a ghost or other supernatural being supposedly responsible for physical disturbances such as loud noises and objects thrown around the room. Yeah. So sure. in the, yeah. So in this case, they are saying some sort of external thing. Yeah. That's making. So it that's you oh, know. Absolutely. I was just saying. 
I answered the question. You, <laughs> you did. did. You no, did. No, it, you did a great job. It's exactly it just, we what all, I wanted to hear. We all took it way further than what I, I intended. Think it's, oh, that's so. fine. I, well, and at the end of the day, can a poltergeist? I'm not saying all poltergeist cases are like that. Sometimes yeah. you will. You know, a poltergeist could be a very low vibrating spirit that is just wandering through your house, banging on the wall at two o'clock in the morning to wake you up. I mean that's yeah. that's just, that's the reality of the situation. But it's a very physical thing. That's yes, what that's what we're not, going at. Yeah, yeah yes, definitely. It's not, it's not. I see something walking through my house. This yeah. thing is throwing plates at me. Yes. 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 Exactly. All right. So let's hear a spooky story from Rebecca. All right. I love this episode already. <laughs> I, I, I could read this in a British accent, but I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure how well I would do. <laughs> so just imagine that I am. Hmm. London has not stopped talking about these crazy happenings at the Enfield home. Every few days, there's a new headline in the paper about another thumping noise or furniture moving. There's even a police report about a chair moving. But I don't believe any of it. There are two young girls at the heart of this story, and it's clear they just want attention. Or maybe their mom wants attention in a new house or money. But I can't believe how many journalists are going into this home and feeding into this ridiculous story. Now, today, my editor has told me I have to go and report on this house and this family. I work for the BBC radio. What a state we are in if I'm being asked to report on ghosts. I uh, I just got home from the Enfield house. It um, it wasn't what I was expecting. I thought it it would be so obviously fake that I would just easily see the girls or or someone else making these things happen. But I was wrong, so very wrong. When I got there. Everyone was kind, but tired. It was clear I was just the latest in a string of reporters invading their lives, but they were still polite. I walked around the house, just taking it all in. While I was upstairs, I heard knocking coming from one of the bedrooms. Loud, insistent knocking. This wasn't a pipe. It was someone knocking on a door or maybe a wall with purpose. Thinking, aha, I've caught them. I opened the door to the bedroom, ready to confront the knocker, only to be met with no one. No one. I checked the room next door to be safe, but that door had been opened and no one had been in there. I tried to dismiss what had happened, but then it happened again. While I was next door, I heard it again. I ran back and again, no one. I could hear the family downstairs. I decided to sit down with Janet to interview her. I was still a little shaken by what happened upstairs, but I just kept telling myself it was pipes or or something else that could be explained. Janet was pleasant and answered my questions, but then she seems to fade out. I don't know how else to describe it. She was there and then she wasn't. And then I heard the voice. This deep guttural voice came out of this little girl. I have never heard anything like it. I went into that house a skeptic, but I left a believer and my life will not be the same. Interesting. I I like how you... Um, made her a skeptic and then a believer. So are you saying that I'm going to leave this episode a believer? <laughs> <laughs> I am saying that that is a real story uh, from a reporter mm. um, who um, basically said that she, you know, then actually she's not the only one, um, but there, there were several stories that I read of um, 
uh, of reporters who, you know, were asked to go in and report on, you know, this thing, because, of course, everyone was talking about it. Um, but uh, but basically, yeah, she went in and was like, you know, nope, I don't believe in any of this. And then um, her name was Roz Morris. Um, and I'll, of course, I'll link to the article where she talks about this. Um, and she says it stuck with her the rest of her life. Wow. Bob, what what did you think of that story? Rebecca needs to go work for Audible. Like <laughs> doing audiobooks. I my favorite part of Ghostly 100 percent is Rebecca's ghost story. Uh, Other than you bickering about like your debates at the end, that's always fun. It's Rebecca's not bickering. Story, so. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're okay. debating. We're discussing. It's it's debate. <laughs> okay, fine. It's I find it adoring, but okay. <laughs> Rebecca's ghost story is just such a good hook. I, I don't know why she doesn't do the audible thing. Mm. Well, maybe we're thinking about something. So yeah, I, I don't want to spoil any future plans, but we've been talking about doing something with the story. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, okay. Well, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, we'll get to the Pat Facts. this last year, things have been really tough for theater groups. Rebecca and I belong to a production company and theater group called Memoriam Development. Memoriam has several podcasts that we are often on, and several members have been on Ghostly, like Nick, Amanda, and of course, Bob from Bob After Dark. And we have also been in several of their live shows. Obviously, those couldn't happen this last year. So Memoriam has taken one of their most popular shows, the horror anthology Nightshade, and made it digital. They're available to everyone, and you can access them at any time. They've been fantastically spooky, I I gotta say. Right up our ghostly listeners' alley. Live theater is something close to our hearts, and we can't wait to get back to it when we get the all clear. But until then, check out Nightshade and support this Chicago theater group that gives local talent a place to shine. And please consider showing some ghostly love and liking Memoriam Development on all the social medias to find out even more. Thank you. Memoriam Development. All right. We all know how I feel about the Warrens, right? Uh, But this is our search for the truth. And here we're doing another one of their cases. Uh, (laughs) Can't say no. This one is about a single mother named Peggy Hodgson's and her four children. They were living in a suburb of London called Enfield. Uh, It's a borough. Okay. But that's the same thing. It's a suburb, pretty much. Sure. Uh, now, some people consider this to be the most witnessed and valid case of paranormal haunting of all time. So let's take a look at some of the hashtag Pat facts of this case. Pat facts. <laughs> Pat facts. <laughs> that was your concept, Bob. You I came up with Pat it. facts. I, I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> so you own all of that. No, Just no, so no, you no, know. no. That legally, we're taking that back. He does not own any of that. Legally, you do not own anything <laughs> of ours. But <laughs> I'll take I'll take credit for the concept. There yeah, you there you go. Uh, so the haunting occurred at the Hodgson's family home in Enfield between 1977 and 1979. Bob, that was before you were even born. I wasn't even a thought then. No, definitely not. Uh, I was already, you know. Past my terrible twos at that point, so ah. yeah. twos, right, Pat? Not my twenty twos. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that old. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Just uh, wrestling your jimmies. <laughs> wrestling my jimmies. Please don't. <laughs> that is a new <laughs> phrase. I have not heard you that one. Your jimmies? No. no. It, it's you know ice cream. Never mind. 
Well, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So before these events, the family seemed to be pretty normal family, I guess. Uh, you know, it was a family that had been involved in a pretty messy divorce and divorce was not as common back then as it is now. Uh, you think of it now and most children, unfortunately, are part of, a, you know, I don't know if it's most, but many. Yeah. Three out of five marriages end in divorce. That's actually not a true statistic anymore. Well, that's what I'm sticking with. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but I'm just saying it was not as common back then as it as it is now. And uh, I know that the daughters uh, really had a difficult time with this particular divorce. Um, but besides that, you know, you know, kids have some trouble at school, but they were generally thought of as being decent kids. Janet, who was 11, and her sister Margaret, 13, told their mother that the dresser would move some nights. The mother never believed them, though, until one night. She was in the kitchen, located on the main level of the house, and she started to hear some scraping noises coming from the upstairs. Peggy went upstairs to see what it was, and sure enough, the dresser was moving on its own, allegedly. <laughs> it, <laughs> it almost seemed, by her recollection, that the furniture was trying to trap her daughters in the room. And according to Peggy and the girls, the haunting sustained for 18 months. That's a long time. Yep. Uh, so Peggy called the police. She told them that she saw the furniture moving. I'm sure that they loved that. And her daughters heard some weird knocking sounds on the wall. When the police arrived and did their investigation, one of them said, that she saw a chair wobble and slide, but couldn't figure out the cause of it moving. The police told Peggy that this was not something that they could do anything about. What are they going to do, arrest a ghost? And, suge <laughs> and they suggested that she contact her local clergy. Peggy also called a reporter at this time from the Daily Mirror. And when they came out, one of the photographers was hit in the eye with a Lego. Oh, yeah. We're going to be talking and debating all of this stuff, guys. So don't worry. That's awesome. Uh, so after that occurrence, Maurice Gross and Guy Lion Playfair. That is the most awesome name I've ever heard. <laughs> Guy Lion Playfair. Uh, from the Society of, of Psychical Research came and spent a great deal of time in the home where the claim where they claim to have witnessed around 2000 incidents of activity. They said that they saw furniture move, fire starting and stopping for no reason, water filling inside cups, and hearing voices. And Janet Hodgson also talks about a time when a curtain that was next to her bed wrapped around her neck and started to choke her. Eventually, this poltergeist, which it uh, that is what it was classified as, as a poltergeist, started to speak through her, which then that escalates. Uh, the idea of a poltergeist, now it's a possession. Am I correct in that, Bob? You are absolutely correct. Okay. So now at this point, it had been talked about on the news. And there was even an interview with the Hodgson family where Janet went all kinds of crazy. Uh, the Daily Mirror would revisit this story many times in the next 18 months. So this sounds like a case for the good old Ed and Lorraine Warren family. Um, probably because it was starting to pick up a lot of media attention. And although they claim to have only done this for the family, uh, Ed and Lorraine visited the Enfield house in 1978. So um, I have a lot of skeptical opinions about this matter, <laughs> um, but I think I should leave that more for the debate. Okay. Do you think that's fair, Rebecca? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, um, uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about with this. Um, and I think the, the thing about Ed and Lorraine Warren is that... Um, that they th lie? That they only were a part of this case for like two days out of the two years. You know, they... they but it was for the family. Well, Janet herself, uh, as, a, as an adult... Um, says she remembers the time um, that they were there, that they that they were very um, kind to her, 
and seemed um, to want to help her. Um, uh, but they didn't stay. So yeah. they only came for a couple of days and, and then they, they left. Yeah. Um, Bob, do you have they anything? they did believe um, that she was telling the truth. Sure. Bob, do you have anything to add to the history of the Enfield case? <sighs> Nothing positive. <laughs> oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I know that in the movie, um, they actually say at the end that Peggy died in 2003, which, I mean, I, that part is fact. Yes. But they say that she died in the chair that Billy, the supposed um, haunting of the house, which is not really talked about too much in other oh, instances. Oh, I found it. Oh, okay. Oh, it's there. We're going to talk about it. Okay, but that she died in the same chair that Billy died in. Yeah, that the old man died in. Yeah, that yeah. Bill died in. Um, yeah, that part I don't know, but I do know that she did stay living in the house. Um uh janet said that um there was a priest that visited not too long before things seemed to quiet down and so she attributes that to the priest finally coming and blessing the house Mm. um you know we'll talk about what what i think you know maybe it was but i attribute it to the paranormal investigators leaving i attribute it to them growing older Oh, okay. Well, we can definitely talk about that. Um, but and, and then I will say I did read um the first people that moved in after um the mother died um did claim they felt that they people the kids said they thought people were watching them and they just felt uncomfortable in the house and that they left. Um, but then whoever bought it after them have said they haven't ever experienced anything. I hope they fixed it up a little. <laughs> yeah uh well if we we could do this right now just really quick the movie versus the real story sure you know that most of the the enfield parts in conjuring 2 are truish you know to what was reported by family and witnesses um one part um that just kind of a little thing but peggy really did go to the neighbors um so that first night with the chest of mm. drawers she did go across the street to her neighbors the husband did come and investigate. He heard thumping and knocking. He could not find causes. So he su- did suggest that she call the police. Um, and she did. Um, things were not nearly, though, as violent and destructive, I think, as uh, as in the movie, of course, as always, those Conjuring movies, they make it, you know, the table doesn't just move five inches. It, like, smashes against the wall. Sure. And, like, <laughs> destroys everything in the room. And, like, you know, that definitely was not... <laughs> the level of uh of things happening um and and then well i said earlier too it's like again the warrens did visit did visit and investigate for a few days but basically none of the rest of the story of the um of the warrens in that movie is based on anything in reality like the nun character yeah the nun the wasn't there thing not there like Whoa. you know <laughs> like none of any of that was like anything well, okay. in the warrens so of course because ed is a demonologist uh, everything is a demon to him. Yeah, you know, I read an interesting thing, and Bob, I'm interested what you think of this, that um, someone was saying, you know, when, when American investigators investigate, they will more likely go with the demon idea because of like Jacobian, you know, our historical, again, the people that fled to, um, you know, the, the Europeans that came to America, you know, were more that like devil, Satan, hell, heaven, you know, whatever versus in Europe, they might be more like, yeah, it's a person, it's a ghost, you know, um, and the Warrens certainly were always believed everything was a demon instead of a ghost. I, uh, that's a good point. I think it's faith based. Mm. Um, if I sit down and I work with an investigator that comes from, I'll just throw out Catholicism, right? Because that's where I was, you know, I was born and raised a Catholic. So mm-hmm. I'll I'll use that as an example. And if you're a faith biz, a faith-driven paranormal investigator, you may ultimately fear the demon thing more than a ghost. And when things are really bad, you'll probably jump at the idea of it being a demon. Ed and Lorraine Warren were extremely religious. So anytime you have something that's more than just footsteps in the house or simple knocking the second you see a plate fly as used the plate flying as an example or the second <laughs> mm-hmm. a Lego flies well that's a demon because mm-hmm. now you're you're being uh you're interacting with something in a very negative physical 
thing, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's the thing. I think it just depends on where you're, what you know where you're coming from and your background or your faith driven thing. The reality of the situation is not every haunting is a demon. You know, depending on who you speak to, there's more demon hauntings than ghost hauntings, and that would be terrifying. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, Bob, I do have a question for you. How does yeah. how does one become a demonologist? Well, it, I, it's a good question. And <laughs> I, there's a certain person that's around today, and I'm not going to name drop him, but he's a, he's a famous paranormal investigator. Got a Zach TV Baggins. I didn't say it, you did. <laughs> Who used to the term demonologist. And I have to sit back and wonder, what the hell is a demonologist? Excuse my expression. So a demonologist in old terms is somebody who studies the occult and specifically interactions with demons. Wait, so you like you are kind of a demonologist. I then. am. I would consider myself a demonologist. But people that read one book or like I have watched this movie or I've interacted with and I quote demons will call themselves a demonologist when in reality it's not a it's it if you use the the proper terminology there were people that locked themselves up in and like monks and stuff would sit down and they would read these tomes and mm. they would practice some form of magic with a k to figure out how to communicate with these low vibrating kind of entities and know how to communicate how to deal with and how to coexist whereas a person might just say they're a demonologist because i don't know man you, you know who the gall is or something it, it's it's such a sh term that gets thrown around quite a bit I, I I don't know how I, I don't know how to answer that in 2021 because I feel like people that may know one or two things will call themselves that term when in reality you have to like study for that kind of a thing. It's not as simple as fill in the blank, right? Wait, I, that means that that I am kind of a demonologist. Well, I was just gonna say I think you could even be a demonologist and not even believe in demons. I mean, I think yeah. that could just be I've studied that it. just yeah. There are a lot of people in this world that do believe in them and a lot of things written about them over you know, hundreds, thousands of years, and so it could just be understanding. Yeah. I mean, in know. the last three years I've done so much studying into demons, it's unbelievable. Yeah, so <laughs> By, by today's standards, Pat, you would be a demonologist even if you are on the skeptical side because at the end of the day, people who are skeptics too might be very fascinated by the concept of what is a demon and they may do a ton of research and yeah, but the other thing is to be, I think, in the traditional sense of a demonologist, you have to work with and against an actual apparition or physical manifestation of a demon oh. in order to be a demonologist. But, okay. but as, like a, a as, a, as a demonologist, can I make other demonologists? Can I like... Can you, I guess you could tell them what to read. Can I like knight them as demonologists? I don't think that's how that works. I don't think... <laughs> I don't think a biologist will just wake up one day and knight somebody to be a biologist, right? But why not? Because you have to you get have the to knowledge. Study. Yeah. But uh, you don't want me you don't want me prescribing you a a drug or something for your sniffles yeah. <laughs> because some biologist told me that I could mix A and B. Same concept <laughs> for a demonologist. I don't well, I, I wouldn't I want a biologist to prescribe me any medication I anyway. Said I'm sorry. <laughs> I promise, but yeah. Same concept. You know what I mean? You're not an accrediting uh, agency. Oh, uh, yet. I am not yet. Uh, yes. Yes. I will become yeah. one, though, for Ghostly. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So, oh, go ahead, Bob. I would say just in, in conclusion, it's a very old term for somebody that that was their study in their faith based. Mm. Or if they just had a really big interest in that topic, they studied, studied, studied. I know the... I know how they work in different aspects. I know how they work in different faith bases. I am an expert in this field. I would be a demonologist. But, you know, it's kind of funny to me that Ed um, claims that he is a demonologist, or he did, but Lorraine did not claim that. And I think she knew equally about the demons. I mean, and The Conjuring 2 kind of shows us that. 
Right. Well, the big thing with her, she felt herself a, a psychic and a medium, and that was her primary um, work that okay. she did. And she felt that, I think, a bit more than I just found it interesting. You know? well, I, I think there's, I think it's a title thing, too, if that makes sense. And I'm not talking down about Ed's work by any means. The man was extremely intelligent in what he knew. Mm. And regardless of how you feel about him, Pat, he legitimately knew his stuff. I think Lorraine didn't need the title of that. You know, she was a very, in my opinion, a very gifted woman in her own sake. And I don't think she needed the title. Okay. All right. That's fair. Um, That's my opinion, of course. (laughs) Okay. Well, let's go ahead and we're going to take a break and then we're going to get into the debate. Oh, hey there, Cal Panic. I got a question for you. What's that, Bob? What do you know about Mothman, the Loch Ness Monster, ghosts, demons, and things that go bump in the night? Not much, Bob. Well, lucky for you, we host a podcast called Bob After Dark, where we talk about legends, lore, and the supernatural. Wow. Where can I find this podcast? Wherever you find your great podcasts at. All right, Rebecca, what do you have for me? Okay, let's do this. Now, you mentioned uh, several of the things. Uh, that we want to debate. Um, and so I'm just going to, don't worry, we're going to get a chance to talk about uh, all the key ones. Um, but I did want to say before we start that it was difficult to <laughs> select just a few pieces of evidence to talk about. Uh, you mentioned this, you know, Graham Morris, he was uh, one of the photographers that was there uh, with a reporter kind of as a journalist. Um, and he basically has kind of a collection of a lot of the documentation about the haunting and he says that his photos are part of over 2000 separate reported incidents supplied by over 30 eyewitnesses. Hmm. Uh, so <laughs> had to pick, you know, just a few things for us to talk about. So we are going to definitely focus on some of the more popular, more common ones that people talk about. So I think we should start with that first reported incident, which was the moving chest of drawers. Okay. So according to the BBC, uh, quote, on the night of the 31st of August, 1977, Peggy Hodson a Hodgson uh, enters her, entered her children's bedroom to find the dressing table moved across the room. In a recorded interview, she recalls what happened. Uh, quote, I just couldn't believe it. In fact, I pushed it back twice and a third time I couldn't move it. The uncanny event was accompanied by repeated knocking noises. So Hodgson sent for her neighbor. Okay. Uh, I think first we should go to Bob. In okay. These. Yeah. So, Bob, what are your what are your thoughts about the first occurrence? I would say that there might be something paranormal going on in the house. And I think that's a good baseline to start. You said, you know, in the story, we're dealing with a really nasty divorce in a time when divorces were very taboo. And a lot of a lot of times when you have like a really nasty negative energy, it's a very beacon kind of a deal for something to hang out in. So is it possible that a dresser was moving on its own? Yeah, I would argue that that's uh, probably a really good point. It's very possible that something could have been hanging around there because it was drawn into negativity. So I'll bite. Okay. Uh, So I just have so much. um, (laughs) There's so much skeptical evidence in this that it's really difficult for me to figure out which one I want to use for which particular case. Uh, So I'm going to start with this. Um, I find it very interesting that when Peggy called the police, she also called a reporter. She did not call the reporter until after the police had been there. Okay, but she did call a reporter, though. I mean, like, to me, like, if something is going on in my house that I believe is paranormal, I don't think I'm going to think of a reporter for a pretty long time. I think I'm going to probably, um, I mean, who are you going to call? Uh, <laughs> well, back uh, then there were, I mean, so, I, you know, I I guess my thought is that, you know, if there's something in your, something's happening in your house and things are moving and there's knocking noises and your neighbor can't find anything and the police come and are like, Psh, yeah, we, we don't, we don't know. Uh, 
like you know what like nowadays people still will call like you know the channel five news for like the you know consumer help or whatever i mean if your thought is there's just something going on like with my house like but it's a red flag for me because if something if something strange in your neighborhood who are you gonna call i mean you know I would probably call Bob first because he's got a proton pack. It's just a prop. <laughs> um, but anyways, so that is one thing that I, I would like to point out that I find, first of all, kind of a kind of a red flag. I mean, you have to admit it's kind of a red flag. Might not be totally a red flag, but it's kind of. You know, I don't know. I'm not there. I wasn't at at that time. Like what the how easy was it to find a paranormal investigator to come to your house? I mean, maybe that's your way of I mean, this isn't like a time where you could go on the Internet and search paranormal investigator, like <laughs> maybe calling the news and thinking maybe they'll write something about this. Maybe then people who are out there that know something about this will find the story and find me and come and help me. OK, but I I do find it very interesting that she did that okay. so let's just leave it at that well no bob keeps trying to say something. i know i'm gonna i'm gonna i was going to do that okay i was gonna go to bob after that so bob <laughs> what are your what are your thoughts and i totally understand the argument that you're coming from it, yes the first thing you think of is like i called the cops they're not going to do anything so the first thing I'm calling it, you know, I'm going to call a clergy and then a reporter. I can understand why that would be a red flag situation. But you also have to understand that at that point, if you're that desperate for help, you're going to seek help wherever you can. And you can't just open up your yellow pages and look in there for Ghostbusters. It's not it's not (laughs) there, despite despite your probably your sadness in that regard. It is. Yeah. When did when did the original Ghostbusters come out? 1984. 1984. So, yeah, we're seven years before that. Yeah. So we're seven years before the Ghostbusters. And, I, you know, in a lot of cases, especially like the Society for Psychic Research, you might not even know they exist if you're just a common person that doesn't deal in this sort of a thing. I can understand why she would call a reporter because you don't know who to call, you, you know, and maybe you can get an expert in there based on it. Uh, to maybe give you a better clear head and that the regard is, you know, even if you get like what I'm just going to use the term contractor. First thing that comes to mind, even if a contractor watches that and is like, Oh, I could totally explain that. And they go there and they're like, Oh, your house is built on a, you know, a fault line or something. And I don't know. I'm just, again, spitballing. That gives you a chance to get a peace of mind, but you don't know who to call. So a report is going to go out there. So you might actually get somebody to help you out, even if it's not paranormal based. You know what I mean? So I'm citing Rebecca on that. Okay. I mean, that's just one of the many things that I have. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, it just, to me, it's a red flag. Uh, there's also a lot of other stuff that go on with this uh, story, um, you know, because Peggy was struggling to make rent. Mm-hmm. She, that's a known thing. She was struggling to make rent. Um, she was a single mother raising four children in London. London is very expensive. I, I, I just feel that there was a monetary connection with this. But I'm going to go on and we will (laughs) debate more as we go. Um, So overall ratings, Rebecca, what would you give this? Uh, So for the chest of drawers moving this one, I give an eight. eight? Uh, I feel this is very like a traditional. Again, we just kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier. Either the girls had some uh, and that kind of bad energy of the house you know, maybe they moved it with their emotions or, you know, could have been an entity at this point. I'm not sure uh, for that part. But I, I do think that these three people witnessing this um, uh, it seems um, very uh, possible. All right, Bob, what is your rating for this particular piece of evidence? Middle of the road. I'm going straight five. OK, five. Uh I am going to go zero, uh, and I know that that, you know, is not very alarming, but I just, I mean, to me, there is 
more monetary aspect of this than there is paranormal because she was struggling for rent. And for me, I always go, the simplest solution is usually the correct one. Now, I feel like I have to say something about that a little bit since we're bringing it up. Um, again, from what I've read, and I, you know, who knows, um, but uh, from what I've read, they made no money on this. This was not, they didn't get paid for these newspaper articles. There wasn't any, any, there were, you know, now there's been movies and things about it, but at the time, none of that happened. Um, and in fact, they were ridiculed and the children were made fun of at school. And oftentimes people that report these paranormal happenings or aliens or any of that make no money on it. And in fact, sometimes have their lives ruined because of the reporting. Well, I am not saying that they made money on it. I think there was intent to make money on it. I think that you know, and, and that to me just is the simpler solution to this possible thing than to believe that there was something actually pushing dressers. Okay. Uh, so that yeah. is where I'm at. I got gotcha. you. That. No, that's good to make sure we got that clear. All right. So let's go to the next one. All right. Um, and I think this one's the big one uh, or one of the, the two big ones. Um, so let's talk about Maurice Gross, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, he recorded many things, reported many things, but let's focus on those voice recordings, right? Yes. That was... That is really big. You're going to see those or hear those, see YouTube videos with those. Um, Maurice uh, interviewed Janet many times. um, And in the beginning, um, she would communicate with him um, with barks and growls. But in November 1977, she started to talk using a gruff, manly voice um, is how it was described. Uh, Gross said that the voice identified itself as a former resident of the house Bill Wilkins. I mean, I think it just said Bill, um, but he had died uh, at the age of 72. Um, uh, He was cross-examined by Richard Gross, who was Maurice's son, um, who was a lawyer, I believe, um, and asked if he remembered how he died. Bill replied again at through Janet. "Um, I had a hemorrhage and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. The voice also announced, I'm invisible because I'm a G-H-O-S-T. Um, the story of dying in a corner seat in the living room was later corroborated by Mr. Wilkins' son, Terry. Richard put out a like a notice about that. Hmm. So we've got, um, this is kind of the possession piece. So okay. was Janet possessed by Bill and, you know, was he talking through her? All right. Bob, what are your thoughts with that? Um, I've witnessed my personal self of possessions, right? Or at least what I would conceive as a possession. That's, it's interesting that it was able to point out exact details of death and it was able to pinpoint exact like details and whatnot. And that's very common amongst possession cases with just kind of like a spirit, like a low vibration spirit. Um, so yeah, it's a good piece of evidence, I suppose. I, uh, will crack that wide open here in a little bit with a couple people that investigated, investigated the house later, but definitely a cool piece nonetheless. All right. Uh, for me, um, so looking at some of the evidence, uh, in here, I actually found a, um, skeptical, um, look at this. And I found it very interesting. Um, The psychical researcher, Renee Haynes, um, so she does believe in these kind of things. She is a believer, had noted that doubts were raised about the alleged poltergeist voice at the Second International Society for Psychical Research, the SPR as they're called. And uh, it was a conference at Cambridge in 1978 where video cassettes from the case were examined. And the SPR investigator, Anita Greger, stated that the Enfield case had been overrated, categorizing several episodes of the girl's behavior as suspicious and speculated that the girl had staged some incidents for the benefit of journalists seeking a sensational story. And John Belloff, a former president of the SPR, investigated and suggested that Janet was practicing ventriloquism. Both Beloff and Gregory came to the conclusion that Janet and Margaret were playing tricks on the investigators. And so much so that they've actually went to a 
master ventriloquist and asked him his opinions on the voices. And he said, oh, yeah, it's a simple trick that could be done. Also, uh, Janet was detected doing trickery throughout this whole thing. Uh, a video camera in the room next door caught her bending spoons and attempting to bend an iron bar. Gross uh, had observed Janet banging a broom handle on the ceiling and hiding his tape recorder. According to Playfair, one of Janet's voices, she called Bill, displayed a habit of suddenly changing the topic, and it was a habit that Janet also had. Uh, when Janet and Margaret admitted pranking to the journalist, Gross and Playfair compelled the girls to retract their confession. They were mocked by other researchers for being easily duped. And uh, it's just very interesting to me that the um, Bill, Billy, or whatever, uh, only knew stuff that Janet would know and only had the ideas and spoke in the same patterns as Janet did. Uh, it's very interesting to me. I uh, And Janet herself has confessed publicly to, to at least 2% of the Enfield case being all trickery. So, uh, Bob, I'm, I think I want to let you talk and then I'm going to defend on all of these things. Uh, but I have a feeling from what you've said that maybe you've read similar accounts as Pat has or with yes. some of these thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where this is where the case gets really wonky. And I don't want to go on a major tangent, so I'll make it as brief as possible. Some of my favorite investigations in the world is when they bring magicians in and i'm not talking like magic with a k i'm talking illusionists yeah like a, like they, jacob mayfield yeah, yeah. um there were, and, or people of the trade to come in and try to explain what happened mm -hmm. and there are two people in the case that have uh, investigated this one is milborn christopher who was an yes. american magician. uh mill uh, milborn christopher actually went into the house and was you know messing around with the walls and how echoes work because they're masters of their craft and pretty much what he was able to say is a lot of this stuff he was very suspicious about by the way milborn christopher was not a skeptic he was also a believer in the world of the paranormal but understood how trickery can go the other thing was that ventriloquist i don't know if you're referring to ray allen yes yes i am yeah, Ray Allen, the ventriloquist, actually went to the house and actually performed his craft in the house in order to bounce echoes and sound off to see how things would work as far as throwing his voice and how changing pitch in, you know, audio recordings. And that right there, in my opinion, is the biggest red flag because you're not having skeptics come in there you're having people kind of of a third party and it's so fun when you see a parallel with that with in paranormal investigations uh one of my favorite being like the stories of harry price and i'll actually that's part of my debate at the end talking about him but you have those types of people that are investigating and they're able to explain some of the things that happen in the house now will i say that she wasn't possessed eh, maybe Maybe that once, because when somebody gets on camera, they it's a psychological fact that when somebody's on camera, they change, they change how they act. So maybe when being recorded, maybe being on video when this is happening, you know, maybe there's something channeling through her, and then she stretched the truth a little bit. Hmm. So in okay. the sake of a believer's argument, I would say that maybe something was going on with her, but maybe. The pub, the what's the word? Publicizing the the publications what, what, that we're not looking for. When all of that is on her, she starts maybe acting a little bit. So okay. that's that's where I'll end on that one. So um, I think there's a lot uh, going on here. Um, I guess I'll say uh, a couple things. Um, number one, I I, I don't know. Um, I don't know that we know for sure that Janet knew about Bill as a, a former resident. I don't think he had been the one that had been the previous owner, for example. It didn't sound like. Um, 
So I don't know if she knew that ahead of time or not, but you know, certainly could be possible information she had. Um, I think the voice itself, when you listen to it on the tape, while it doesn't sound like a 13 or 11 year old girl, um, it also doesn't totally sound quite as unreal <laughs> as sometimes these recordings do. Um, it does sound more like a human kind of making a, a growly voice. Um, though I will say um, when listening to Maurice Gross talk about it, he said, you know, the way that she talked, it was it's something that it is something a human voice can do. Um, but that if you do it for longer than just a, a few minutes, you know, most most people would you know, you would be able to tell right after that they had been doing that to their voice and he, that that didn't happen with her. Uh, have you ever but, heard of death metal? Yeah, there you go. So I suppose she could have trained herself to be that way. So again, I, I, I do struggle with the voice. I, I will say that. Um, and then the other piece, though, when it comes to um, the 2% um, that they she admits to doing, uh, I, I, I find her explanations believable. Um, which is there was so much attention on this case. And, you know, these journalists would show up, I mean, over and over again, um, different ones, they would come in and, and she said they would just, you know, be staring at her and, and put these microphones on her and watching her. And so some, you know, they're there for hours and nothing happens. Uh, we talked, Jack, Jack Chavez talked about that as the wildlife photographer thing, right? Yeah. You know, you're just waiting for something paranormal to happen. And it wouldn't, and she would sometimes feel like they were getting angry with her and upset with her that things weren't happening. And so, yeah, they would do stuff just to like give these reporters something or to get them out of the house or to make them happy. Um, and you know what? When you're especially especially a, a woman <laughs> and especially a young girl, I totally understand that need um, to do that. They also said sometimes they would do things to see if the paranormal investigators would figure it out. Like, in other words, like, are they being are they being truthful? Are they good investigators? Can they tell the difference between when they were faking it and when things were really happening? And they said they always caught them, always, that they always were able to figure it out when they, it was a fake well, thing. Well, my, my thing is this, is if you are going to say that, okay, I was caught and 2% of what I did was fake, but it was only 2%. I don't believe that number. First of all, I believe your credibility is now damaged because she did not come clean to this before being caught. She was caught and then came clean. And also, too, this is an idea that I, that I have, and I also read it in the evidence from the skeptical side, is that she... So this is going to be hard for you, Rebecca, I know. So... Um, but there, you know, there was two young girls in the house that, uh, their father was nowhere to be seen. They, uh, Peggy and the father did not have a good divorce and he was not, um, you know, like talking to the daughters at all. And I feel that they wanted the male attention from, um, gross and guy LaFerre. Uh, I really believe that they did not want them to leave. So they wanted to keep proving that there were there was something going on. Well, I do think there can be um, times where, again, once something starts, and I think we've seen that a lot of times <laughs> with uh, stories that we've done, um, like the with the Bell Witch and just different things where like once it starts, you know, you kind of feel this pressure um, for it to, to happen. Um, but I don't think that that just to me, that doesn't discount the fact that there are things that did happen that were weird. And again, for me, I feel like it was those girls at that age manifesting things and that they didn't know how to control it. Sure. Um, and then it escalates. And then all of a sudden, there's all these reporters in your house and all these people and you have to perform and you have to, you know, provide them with stuff because that's how the world works, you know, if they want you to perform and prove all of this. Otherwise, I mean, you're already getting made fun of enough. It's only going to get worse. Well, um, so also, you do what you do. Also, Peggy was involved in another relationship and they did not like that guy at all. So I believe that they brought these people in here to stop their relationship. 
Can I bring up one more point to the voice thing? Yeah. You know, the next bit of evidence. Yeah. I don't know how much, I don't know how much research you guys have done in possession cases or like maybe like watched evidence, right. Or seen it happen. I've seen it happen like in my life, um, in investigations and in cases. And I've watched more than I need to of you know, videos of these things happening. A lot of times when you see a possession case, um, and where something is talking through somebody, it's very rare when you see a case where it can change someone's voice, right? A lot of times in a case of a possession, they may start speaking in tongue. They may start making mutterings, but I don't typically see them like growling and, you know, acting in the, some of the ways that this young lady did, um, I would say that it there, I would argue that there's probably something going on there, but as far as like the growls and the grunts and the, et cetera, it might be more performance-based or stress-based as in Rebecca's point, when you have all these reporters, you know, coming to you, sometimes that just might happen. I don't want to discredit the fact that it could happen. And I'm not trying to say that there's no possession going on, period. I'm just saying as far as what I've seen, I don't see a lot of possession cases, especially with the verbal, where it changes their thing without it being more production. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, another thing that I'd like to bring up and then we can move on. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's all right. Yeah, we can Um, get to our ratings here. But is that, you know, as I said... She seemed to, Janet seemed to only know things that Janet would know, even when she was speaking as Bill, and talked in the same patterns as as Janet did. Again, I think that's something that I would I would not necessarily agree. Is well, the case. but at the so. Roth House, I mean, we have uh, Rancy Venom, mm. who knew all these things that she shouldn't have known. Yeah, true. That is definitely more believable to me than this. Yeah. So how how would you rate this, Rebecca? So again, for me, this one is a is a little lower. Uh, it's more of a six. Okay, a six. Yeah, because I I do think that it it the voice sounds a little weird to me. So I'm not okay. totally there with it. All right, Bob, how do you rate this? Middle of the road out of five again. All right, you're at a five, and I'm going to go zero again. All on right, this one. there we go. Mm-hmm. All right, let's keep moving forward. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the famous photographs. Yes. Uh, so, uh, again, that photo a photographer, Graham Morris, uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, he took the famous levitation photos. He was not present in the room with the camera. It was set to automatically take photos every 15 seconds. Uh, he described that in one photo, quote, Janet looks to have come up from a prone position flying across the room and she's in midair. There are so there are several photos. The most famous one is is her mm-hmm. um, kind by of her jumping bed. by her bed. Yeah. Um, but there are a few other ones out there too, and I'll yeah. I'll try to you know have some of those on our our show notes page. Um, Bob, so, have you yeah. seen these pictures? I have. There's a okay. couple I've seen. I'll admit that I've not seen all of them because I know there was a lot of documented photos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have not seen all of them. I've seen the uh, the bed one. Obviously, is like the big one. A lot of people share that in the paranormal communities. So it's a it's actually a really good picture. Mm-hmm. Whether you want, it's still a fun photo of a paranormal event. Yeah. So it it is. I have seen them. Yes. So what are, what are your thoughts? Spirit photography. And I'm just going to look at for sake of timing. I'm not going to go into all of it. But spirit photography is a very tricky thing i do come from a somewhat background of photography and i understand that you can that a trick of a camera can make things look like things all the time however there are times when you just can't explain what you caught um and no matter how much you try to make things look like they are it comes out that way you know what i mean so i would say that in this one it's there's believable photos. It's really hard for me to buy into something like this one, like full on. It's a weird photo. It's hard to explain, but I don't necessarily know if I'm diving headfirst into that as that straight levitation. You know what I mean? Absolutely. 
Uh, and I would say that the most famous picture, it literally looks like she jumped out of bed and it captured her right in the, you know, middle of the, um, in like the air. So simulating a uh, levitation because you could see in her face, uh, the muscles were, it wasn't like, like a levitation is a slow thing. It's not a very fast thing. And it showed in her face the muscles contracting like it was jumping or pouncing Mm -hmm. almost. Yeah, I think for me, this is the weakest of the evidence sure. for me, just because it does really look like it could just be you captured someone in the middle of a jump. Yeah. Um, and now, could it be that she was being pushed by something or whatever? I mean, I suppose, you know, that's all possible. Yeah. Um, you know. And- but now that's like the rage, right, is taking the picture where everyone's jumping. Right. And, and they have the same expression on their face as she did if, on there. If there was a video... You yeah. know, that would be different, yeah. but it is difficult with the photo. Like you said, Bob, you know, I mean, you can capture so many things that make things look weird. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm going to say this. I'm going to tell a quick little story that I don't know if I've shared on Ghostly. If I have, I apologize. Um, I have been a part of a levitation before. Ah. So um, not that I levitated, um, but someone close to me, um, we did our classic. Stiff as a board, light as a feather. You got it. 12 years old, you know, girls, light as a feather, stiff as a board. And absolutely 100% that is what happened to one of my friends. Um, It is the most paranormal thing that has happened to me in my Mm. life. Um, uh, and this, this is a girl who had a lot of things going on, uh, paranormally with her. Um, but that, you know, particular moment I was a part of, um, it did happen and it does not, it didn't look anything like these photos. You, you (laughs) did share it on an episode because Cheryl commented on it. Your friend Cheryl. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that is interesting. Um, so did we already do ratings? We did not do ratings for this so what, one. So what is your rating? So my rating for this one is a three. Three. They're definitely low okay. for this one. Yeah. Bob, what's your rating for this one? Just like my entire rating for this entire thing, middle of the road out of five. So, But you're <laughs> higher than Rebecca on this That's one. True. You're more of a believer. I, because there, I, I will make an argument sake that it was technology wasn't where we have it now. True. Where someone can you know go in and Photoshop whatever they want over things. So you kind of get what you get. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not sold on it by any means, but I, uh, I, I will at least for argument's sake say it's a strange photo. And some of the other ones I have seen are definitely strange. Yeah. So okay. I, for strange sake, it gets middle of the road at five. Okay. I'm going to go a zero. Although I would like to say that I am impressed with how many photos that there are. I just, I, I know that uh, there was some trickery done, and I think this is pretty obviously showing it. Mm, Okay. All right. So next one, we're going to keep going with uh, uh, Graham Morris, the photographer, and we're going to go back to something you mentioned in the history. He was hit above the eye with a Lego. Mm. (laughs) Uh, Morris describes the incident this way. Quote, it was clear that the uncanny happenings were occurring when the children were there. Uh, Or sorry, he the reporter uh, said this. Morris stood in the gloom in the kitchen and one by one, they brought the children in asleep in the adults arms. Here's his quote. Uh, The last one to come in was Janet. Suddenly things just took off and just started flying around the room. I got hit by a Lego brick over my right eye. He is convinced still is to this day that the objects weren't being thrown. He moved to the corner to have a clear view of every person there, he said, quote, none of them were doing anything. All right, Bob, what are your thoughts on that? <sighs> I, I want to believe this so bad. Because you but, love Legos? No, I will share a very quick quip. When I was a boy, I actually fell on a Lego and it caused me a, a, a trauma tumor in my foot. So wow. <laughs> That's a fact. Um, but as far as the, as far as this is concerned, I I want to be a hundred percent behind it. Be like straight poltergeist activity, right? This is this is something that is very angry with it. 
with him being there. Uh, but at the same time, I'm conflicted by being like, this guy is a reporter. He's got to make a story of this. And what better way to sell a newspaper by then saying I was con- I was a hundred percent like involved with this case, you know this thing this thing attacked me, I, and that one that one causes a big red flag, but not a total one for me to go zero. So I'll, I'll get my rating at the end. But I, I like to believe it. I want to believe it. But I can understand that there is definitely a hesitation there. Or maybe they were hooking up a advertisement deal with Lego, Lego brand. <laughs> I don't <laughs> listen, I, uh, Lego. If you're listening to this podcast, All right? If you want a sponsor, uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for me, I'm going to say a couple of things about this. Um, so what? The, okay, the first thing that catches m- my attention with this is he's a photographer. His eye is focused on the camera at all times, so he is not really studying the room. In the purest sense, like I hate going to places and taking video because I feel like I am not there at that moment. I'm watching it. And I feel that that is very much the case for a lot of photographers. They are they are doing their thing during that time and not really participating in it. But another thing that I found interesting is that um, the... Throwing of objects only occurred when Janet would come into the room. Um, it was never with any of the other kids. And they never saw the object before it was thrown. So, like, there's crayons being tossed around the room. There's Legos being thrown around the room. They were not present on the floor or any other area until they were thrown. I don't know that. That's not. I part I, of I do know this. Anything. I do know this. I have actually done the research into this mm-hmm. and looked into it, and um, I believe that it was Janet throwing them. Uh, I believe that she had the stuff on her possession at that time and threw them. Um, another thing that I find interesting that has nothing to do with this piece of evidence, but it kind of makes me. This is like one of the things that I think about during this is that when I talked about that there would be like a fire in the fireplace lit and then it would go off. Um, So it was a known fact that there was another possession case in England before this, and I forget the person's name, Um, but it it was another documented one. It was in magazines. And Janet had read this magazine because it was in the particular um, house. They had found it there. So Janet knew of this. So she studied this kind of stuff a little bit. And um, LaFerre told her at one point, uh, yeah, these kind of things happen. And usually when they happen, there is voices. And then voices happened. And then there is, uh, sometimes they even light fires. And then the fire started happening in the fireplace. Uh, it's like after LaFerre told her these things, then they occurred. So this particular incident that we're talking about, the Lego, happened pretty early in the case. Yes. And I don't believe, I don't know for sure that the investigators were there mm-hmm. at this point. But still, she knew of these things from the possession uh, case. I mean, that's, I guess that's possible. Um, you know, I. but to me, um, you know, when he talks about it, uh, you know, he doesn't talk about be actually taking photos at the moment. They were bringing the children in sleeping. They were being carried in um, other people's arms. So he sounds like he has a pretty clear view of every person. I'm pretty sure if Janet was literally taking things out of a pocket and throwing them at people in the room, he would have seen that. Others in the room would have seen her do that. I don't know how she could possibly literally throw things without that being something people see. But during the Fringe Fest, uh, we went to see Jacob Mayfield's show. Mm -hmm. And Jacob Mayfield is a amazing magician, right? Um, Mentalist. Mm -hmm. And um, do you know how he did everything? 
Uh, I actually have a decent idea of a but lot of But do you know things. for sure? 100% no, sure. No, but Janet isn't like a but, magician. But do you still know that that was make-believe magic, right? It, was, it wasn't something that's real. And that's exactly how I feel about this. I don't know exactly how it was done, but I know it was fake. I know it was, and I really strongly suspect that it was Janet throwing things. Yeah. Can, can I make a Can I make a quick point on your case here? Yeah, absolutely. You realize the difference between uh, Jacob Mayfield and this woman, right? No. Jacob mm. Mayfield was a trained magician and a mentalist. Yeah. This woman, I'm assuming, is not a trained. She's magician. eleven. She's a child. Um. Right. It, you know that's what? A hard, that's a hard pill to swallow that someone with years of experience could perform the same thing as somebody else at that age. No, and it's mean? not at the it's not at the Jacob Mayfield level, even. You know, it's it's not. She's see- taking things out of her pocket and throwing whipping them at these people. And they no one sees it happen in a room. <laughs> in a okay. In a room in the 70s in England, the lighting was not what it is now. Like, we have bright lights in this room now. They it, they didn't light up things like that. And also, it's in the middle of the night. They woke people up, and Janet was last. So she obviously saw her sister being taken away, and she had woken up and had time to plan for this. And I'm saying oh. that she she could have studied some of these things right. or learned how to do some trickery. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I think it's, you know what, let's do a vote, right? Because obviously up to the listeners, right? I think we've all given some good cases for this one. And let's, let's see what, let's see. What well, we let's got. do a rating. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Let's do our, let's do our rating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Rebecca? yeah. So for me, this one is a, this one's a seven. It's up there. Seven. I feel like this okay. is that poltergeisty, you know, energy of the girls thing. For me. Okay. Yeah. Bob, where, where are you at with this one? This is the only time I'm going over a five out of seven as well. Wow. Okay, there you and go. this is, I'm going to stick with zero. Yeah, if you go below zero. If I could go below below <laughs> zero on this one, I would. <laughs> All right. We have one more piece of evidence that okay. I want to talk about. And this one is the most important to me. And this is the one that pushed this case to a different place for me. And that is the one of the police. Okay. Um, so in the in this uh, BBC article that I read, uh, they say, quote, uh, WPC, which I forget what that stands for, but police officer, uh, Carolyn Heaps was first on the scene and described seeing a chair sliding across the room. Quote, it came off the floor, maybe a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right about three and a half to four feet before it came to rest. And then this was written up in a police report. I've never heard of that before, ever. That a police officer came to a home, saw a paranormal poltergeisty thing, and felt so strongly that that's what they had seen that they dared to write it in a, an official documented report. The only other time I even came close to that was a little bit with the Resurrection Mary stories and mm-hmm. Justice um illinois but uh yeah to have something officially be documented to me um again more of this poltergeisty kind of stuff early on in the story uh seemed um interesting to me believable all right bob where are you at with this i'm actually with rebecca on it it's a great it, that's a good point in most cases when you have police investigations into something strange they either don't quote on it or they, you know, they do and they, and they're up for ridicule. There's, this isn't a ghost story, but the case of the loved one frog in Ohio, it's a cryptid story. This cop reported it and lost his job. Yeah. Often happens. Exactly. The only other time where I've seen this happen and it, it didn't turn into straight ridicule was the demon house and Gary story uh, that, you guys can go watch the movie. The you know those those things don't come up very often. You have to understand that when a police report happens, especially somebody who's tenured on the force, it's you have to really cover yourself when you're doing that because you are going to be subject to not only ridicule, but you can get subject to losing your job. So I'm a strong 
strong person in that when you have to report something legally, it's you have to make sure your bases are covered. And it goes that's a tough thing to swallow. Now, whether or not the chair is being moved moved by paranormal forces, that's not the argument here. I would say that that's this is probably the strongest bit of evidence, I think, in the case. All right. So I was a security officer for many years. And as that, I went through a lot of the police training and stuff, too. Uh, And doing so, I learned that the police job is not to figure out things. That is not what they're supposed to do. And a lot of times they do nowadays, but that is not what they're supposed to do. What their job is to do is to observe and report and to protect. So them being there, these are not the right people for the job. They are definitely not. They are not paranormal investigators. They do not know what to look for in those particular cases where a a good paranormal investigator would know what I what I need to look for in this particular case. So yeah, she saw a chair move across the floor, um, but her job was not to explain why. That is not that is not their job, and I I really think that she did a great job in reporting it and not trying to explain it. Um, but there could have been trickery that she was not aware of. I mean. Yes, we are saying this is an 11-year-old girl, but we are also saying that she is a very, very clever girl. Um, So I would like to go back um, to—so Bob had brought up Wilburn Christopher. Um, So he did do that investigation. He failed to observe anything that could be called paranormal and was dismayed by what he felt was suspicious activity on the part of Janet. Christopher would later conclude that the poltergeist was nothing more than the antics of a little girl who wanted to cause trouble and who was very, very clever. Uh, So I look back at that and I'm thinking, this is not your average 11-year-old girl that we're, we're, we're thinking of. This is a girl that is super smart and super um, into what she's doing with this. I believe that there was some trickery involved and she was able to to trick this police officer, um, which, as I said, it's not any any um, I'm not trying to put shade on the police officer in that they didn't know that they were being tricked. I am saying that, no, she was this good that she could. And the police job was just to report it. Because they they weren't there to protect. They can't protect against ghosts. That's not their job. So their job was to observe and report. And I will say uh, in a more recent quote, that particular um, police officer did say, you know, I don't know what caused it. All I can say is that that is what I saw. Um, So what's your rating? What do you think, Pat? Well, we usually go with you first. Oh, you want me to go with me first? Okay. All right. Uh, So uh, for this one, I'm giving this one an eight. Again, I think, okay. yeah, very suspicious um, and a believable person reporting it. All right, Bob, where are you at? I'm also going with an eight. I, Despite them reporting it or not, I understand that that's not their job to try to figure things out. It's the fact of the matter is that they put their reputation on the line and reported it nonetheless, as strange as it was. So that's where I'm sticking with. Well, I'm really glad that they did report it. Um, but again... I don't feel these are the right people to know anything. Just calling them a a police officer doesn't mean that they should have knowledge of this kind of thing. So I'm going to go zero again on this one. All right. So that brings us to our overall rating. Rebecca, what is your overall rating with all the evidence that you presented? What do you think of the Enfield case? Uh, I give it a seven. A seven. Seven okay. overall. It sounded a... like you were going to go six there. You're no, like seven. No, no, seven. I, there were a few lower numbers, you know, a few higher numbers. So I'm going to I'm gonna give it a seven overall. All yeah. right. Bob, where are you at? I am middle of the road at a five. All right. And I am going to go surprisingly with a zero on this one. <laughs> um, 
But that brings us to our closing arguments. This is our last chance to convince you to vote our way. We are each given one minute of uninterrupted time. And usually we time each other on our cell phones to keep each other honest. But since um, Bob is being interviewed via phone, I do not have access to my phone. So I'm going to ask Rebecca to actually time us all. And you trust me for this. No, but I'm going to have to. <laughs> so a minute and a half for me. No. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, does Bob get to go first? You want me to go first? Uh, you usually want? you go first. I in these will kind go of things. first. Yeah. Okay. So I'm timing myself, everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. And go. All right. So I do believe in the Enfield haunting. Uh, I do think that there are uh, it's a tricky case because I do think that there are things that maybe were exaggerated or added, um, you know, when you're young um, and things happen to you, uh, it can, things can escalate um, if you push them. Um, but I do think that the, that uh, Janet especially was uh, in, in fact um, manipulating the energy around her and perhaps did attract some energy or entity towards her uh, that caused some of these more poltergeisty things to happen. Um, I am not as sure about the voices or some of the levitating, some of the more, I don't know, maybe bigger things that happen later on. I can understand the pressure she felt. Um, but overall, I do think it happened. It makes sense that after two years, it would have stopped. Um, I've seen it with other girls, and I believe her. All right. All right. That so was you my finished minute. early. Wow. Yeah. All right, Bob, you ready to go? I am. Okay, All right. And go. Enfield is a really interesting case. There's not, there's a lot of red flags, but there's also things that I can't explain that happened in this case. It's going to be one of the few times I'm ever actually in the middle of the road being like, I'm not sure. Do I think that something ha was going on there? Yeah. Was it, was it person interacting their environment, not realizing it? Was there an actual spirit there that just got really blown out of proportion due to the media's attention and Ed and Lorraine Warren's, you know, celebrity being there as well? That's probably the case. At the end of the day, this was a family that was dealing with a lot of hardship. And unfortunately, there were sad things that were going on in the case. And because of that, I have to stick out a five. Make sure you listen to Bob After Dark. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he finished with 10 seconds left. With a plug, too. Yeah, nice. Wow. Way to do it. All right, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Okay, and go. So this case, Janet has already stated that some of it was trickery. I think by doing so, and it was after the fact that she got caught, I believe that she tainted the whole entire thing. And I believe her credibility is nil. I believe she has no credibility in this. She has um, given limited interviews since that since the this time, and in her interviews, she is always very scared and very shaking, and she's not up for public appearance. Um, she's not cut out for that kind of thing. I don't know why they force her to do it, um, but I do feel that this is a case of. You have this broken family and they wanted to repair it somehow and they did what they could to to do so. I don't fault them. I think it's innocent children's play, but that's all that it is, is children's play. All right. Got there with a couple seconds left. Yep. So I want to thank everyone so much for listening. Please share us with your friends and family as word of mouth is our best advertisement. I want to thank Bob Anderson from Bob After Dark for coming back on Ghostly and keeping the title of the um, the guest that's been on Ghostly the most. Oh, I will hold that honor as a high regard. I want you to make <laughs> the actual wrestling title belt for this. So <laughs> <laughs> but then if ever that changes, then you'd have to pass that on to somebody else. I would. That's the point. Yeah. Mm. Uh. Yeah. No, thank you for being on this uh, very high powered episode. I mean, this was a big one and I am so happy to have you have had you on. Uh, you know, this is a big case and it took a, a lot to get through it. So yeah, thanks you for sticking two, with us. You needed two <laughs> believers to fight me on this one. <laughs> can I, uh, can I plug uh, something at yes. the end here? Yeah, absolutely. So if you guys are interested in the Enfield case, 
There is a uh, two-part episode I did of what, my favorite paranormal investigator of all time, Harry Price, mm. who is one part magician, one part paranormal investigator, yes. 100% eccentric. Yes. The strangest cat in the paranormal field of all time, in my opinion. And he did what was considered the first major media BBC being involved paranormal investigation of the Borley reform. Uh, the Borley Rectatory. Rec- I can't talk. The Borley Rectatory. You guys, uh, I have a two-part episode, one about the history of Harry Price and the Borley story and how the paranormal investigation worked with BBC Radio being on site as early as 1925. Wow. wow that's so the something. BBC has always been kind of interested in that stuff. I like yeah, it. So if you guys get a chance, those are older episodes. Um, the Harry Price one is my my acting debut when I actually did the episode in as Harry Price. It was oh, wow. Nice. So if you guys get a chance, mm-hmm. go check out those. If you were into that kind of big limelight paranormal investigation, that was the first. So, you know, that kind of reminds me of one other point I'd like to make about the Enfield no, case. No, 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 we're yes, done. Yes, I am going to make one more. Uh, um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which was um, the inventor of Sherlock Holmes, right? The critical thinking part of Sherlock Holmes uh was uh, duped by a little girl Um, in 1920-something, whatever it was. I forget the exact year, but he was duped, and he's admitted to being duped in that regard. Uh, So this little girl can dupe a lot of people. Don't let it dupe you. Ooh, Girls are awesome mm-hmm. and should be believed. Okay, so we will be starting our weekly episodes next week when we focus all of October on haunted castles. And that comes out on October 6th, just one week away. So excited to to get into castles. Right? Spooky um, ones coming up. Bob, you want to say your parting words here? Yep. Make sure you guys check out Bob After Dark. It's a semi-weekly show these days uh, based on the paranormal, everything legends, lore, and supernatural, things that go up in the night, lights in the sky, encrypted stories. And so, you're the uh, ghost with the most that enjoys toast, right? I am the host with the most that enjoys toast. <laughs> uh, alongside, alongside of my... Uh, my goofy producer who knows nothing about the paranormal, but is along for the ride. You guys will learn something about the paranormal and the or situations that are involved with them. So you learn about cryptids, you learn about aliens and my favorite take on pizza. So it's, it's a good show. I hope you check broccoli out pizza. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, until next time, stay ghostly. Bye. Stay fresh. Cheese bags. <laughs> <laughs>